Hi everyone, this is Miss Romani, and for this lesson, we will explore the respiratory system. In other words, we will explore how we breathe. And we breathe a lot, roughly 10 times a minute. So let's take a closer look at both the anatomy and physiology of the respiratory system to see how this very important life-maintaining process works. Now, the anatomy of the human respiratory system involves different body structures. When we breathe, air flows into our body through our nose or nasal cavity, although sometimes also through our mouth. The air then flows through the pharynx, the larynx, the trachea, on its way to our lungs. The trachea splits first into two bronchi, one for each lung, and the bronchi then split into smaller and smaller tubes that end in tiny air sacs called alveoli. And we have millions of these alveoli in our lungs, which are surrounded by blood capillaries and allow for the movement of oxygen gas out of the lungs and into the bloodstream and carbon dioxide gas out of the bloodstream and into the lungs. And there are also muscles, like the diaphragm, that contract and relax in order to move air in and out of our lungs. So that's the respiratory system in a nutshell. But let's explore this system in a bit more detail. And let's start by exploring the function of this system. The function of the respiratory system can be summarized as ventilation and gas exchange that happens in our bodies to support cellular respiration. Let's start with ventilation. Ventilation, or pulmonary ventilation, is essentially breathing. It is the act of taking in air from the atmosphere into our lungs, a process called inhalation, and expelling air out of the lungs, a process called exhalation. Oftentimes, we describe ventilation as breathing oxygen in and breathing carbon dioxide out. And while somewhat accurate, I think that describing it this way can lead to a common misconception. This misconception stems when people imagine that only oxygen gas is moving into our body and only carbon dioxide gas is moving out. When in reality, the air we breathe in and out is a mixture of gases. Typically, the air we breathe in is mostly nitrogen gas with about 21% oxygen. The other 1% is made up of many other gases, of which carbon dioxide makes up only 0.04%. The air we breathe out, on the other hand, has about 5% less oxygen and about 5% more carbon dioxide gas than the air that we breathe in. The rest of the gases are the same. So we breathe in air with more oxygen and less carbon dioxide than the air we breathe out. Because in our lungs, we exchange oxygen gas for carbon dioxide gas. Which brings us to the second part of the function of the respiratory system. Gas exchange. The purpose of the respiratory system is to perform gas exchange. Pulmonary ventilation provides air to the lungs for this gas exchange process. Gas exchange happens at two sides in the body. In the lungs, where oxygen is picked up and carbon dioxide is released, and at the tissues and body cells, where oxygen is released and carbon dioxide is picked up. External respiration is what we call the exchange of gases between our blood and the external environment. This exchange happens at the alveoli of the lungs. Internal respiration is the exchange of gases with the internal environment, which happens in all the tissues of the body. This exchange of gases happens through a process called simple diffusion. Diffusion is a process in which transport is driven by a concentration gradient. That means that molecules will move across a membrane from an area where they're in higher concentration to an area where they're in lower concentration. At the lungs, gas exchange through diffusion takes place between the millions of tiny air sacs called alveoli and the capillaries that surround them. As you can see in this animation, inhaled oxygen moves from the alveoli, where it's in higher concentration, to the blood in the capillaries, where it's in lower concentration. And carbon dioxide gas moves from the blood in the capillaries, where it is in higher concentration, to the air in the alveoli, where it is in lower concentration. Now at the body tissues, the opposite happens. The cells of our body tissues, especially our muscle tissue, need energy. And in the process of producing the energy they need, they produce carbon dioxide gas and use up oxygen gas. So they have a higher concentration of carbon dioxide gas than the blood that flows through the tissues and a lower concentration of oxygen. Again, 
Since gas is diffused from an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration, carbon dioxide moves into the bloodstream and oxygen into the muscle cells. Which brings us to the final piece of the puzzle, the whole reason for this gas exchange, which is a process called cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is a group of chemical reactions that takes place mostly in the mitochondria of cells. During cellular respiration, cells convert energy found in food molecules, for example, glucose, into a form the cells can use. This form is a molecule called ATP. From each glucose molecule, a cell can theoretically produce up to 38 ATP molecules. Unlike the energy found in the bonds of glucose, the energy found in the bonds of ATP can be easily used by cells for whatever processes required energy. For example, the cell might use ATP energy to complete a chemical reaction, or to transport a nutrient, or to break down a waste product, or to move a muscle. Basically, any process that requires energy in the cell uses energy in the form of ATP. So when we eat, we provide ourselves with the glucose it needs to make ATP. But we need to breathe, because our cells cannot fully convert the energy in glucose into ATP without oxygen gas. Cellular respiration requires oxygen. The reactants of cellular respiration are glucose and oxygen. And the products, besides ATP, are carbon dioxide and water. The water can be used by the cell, but the carbon dioxide gas cannot and needs to be removed out of the body, which we do when we exhale. So ultimately, we need to breathe for the same reason that we need to eat, to provide ourselves with energy. So now that we understand the purpose of the respiratory system, let's explore the anatomy and physiology of the different organs that make up the system. And let's start at the place where air enters our body, the nasal cavity. The primary function of the nasal cavity is to receive the air from the external environment and filter, warm, and humidify it before it reaches the lungs. Air enters through the nostrils of the nose and is partially filtered by the nose hairs, then flows into the nasal cavity. The nasal cavity is lined with epithelial tissue that contains a lot of blood vessels which help warm the air and secrete mucus which further filters and also humidifies the air. The many blood vessels in the nasal cavity is actually the reason why nosebleeds are so common. And of course the mucus producing cells is the reason why we get a snotty nose. The nasal cavity also serves a function unrelated to gas exchange. Up on the roof of the nasal cavity is the olfactory epithelium. Olfactory is just a fancy word that has to do with smelling. The nasal cavity contains olfactory nerve endings with receptors that are sensitive to odor molecules that travel through the air and into our nasal cavity. When those molecules attach to the receptors in our olfactory nerves, we detect that as a smell. After the nasal cavity, air moves into the pharynx. The pharynx, which is basically your throat, is shaped like a funnel. During respiration, it conducts air between our nasal and oral cavities to the larynx and the trachea. Both air and food pass through the pharynx, so the epiglottis, found at the top of the larynx, is there to prevent food from moving down into the larynx and trachea and diverting it into the esophagus. If you remember, we learned about the epiglottis during our digestive system lessons. Then we enter the larynx. The larynx connects the lower part of the pharynx to the trachea. It keeps the air passages open during breathing and is the main organ responsible for producing sound. The larynx is made of cartilage. Inside the larynx are the vocal cords, which have elastic ligaments at their core. Here you can see an animation of a superior view of the larynx. The vocal cords, which are pointed out by the yellow arrows, open and close. When we speak, when we yell, when we sing, Air coming up from the lungs and trachea will vibrate the vocal cords, which is what produces the sounds that we hear. Air then passes from the larynx into the trachea. The trachea is a tube that allows air to move in and out of the lungs, and it is covered by about 20 cartilage rings. These cartilage rings support the tube of the trachea and prevent it from overexpanding or from collapsing. The cartilage rings are actually C-shaped, with a gap on the back. 
and it's this gap that allows the trachea to bend when the esophagus presses against it as food is swallowed. The cartilage rings are connected by elastic tissue. So while the trachea is a firm, rigid tube, it has the ability to stretch and lengthen. Think of a straw. But actually, think of a bendy straw. You can pull the bendy bit of the straw to make the straw longer and then push it back together to shorten it. You can also bend it and it will remain open. So the cartilage rings of the trachea make the trachea like the bendy part of a straw. It keeps the trachea strong, yet flexible, and keeps the airways open even when it bends. The trachea also plays an important role in cleaning the air that is about to reach the lungs. On the inside, the trachea is lined with mucus-producing cells called goblet cells. The mucus produced by these cells traps any dust, pollen, or any other debris that is in the air flowing through the trachea. The inside of the trachea is also lined with hair-like projections called cilia. The cilia are constantly moving, sweeping any mucus, fluids, and foreign particles away from the lungs and towards the throat. And at its bottom end, the trachea divides into left and right tubes called bronchi, which connect to the lungs. The tubes of the bronchi carry air from the trachea into the left and right lungs. They have cartilage and a mucous membrane that are similar to those found in the trachea. In the lungs, the bronchi subdivide into progressively smaller airways called bronchioles, which deliver oxygen-rich air into the millions of alveoli. When we exercise, relaxation of smooth muscle in the bronchioles actually causes them to dilate. This bronchodilation allows more air to reach the lungs. Allergic reactions and chemicals called histamines that are produced by our immune system can cause the opposite effect, bronchoconstriction. When someone who suffers from asthma, for example, is exposed to certain triggers, the smooth muscles within the bronchioles actually become tightly squeezed which then lowers the amount of air that reaches the lungs. Now let's talk about the major organs of the respiratory system, the lungs. The lungs are a pair of spongy organs that contain the bronchi, the bronchioles, but are mostly made up of millions of tiny air sacs called alveoli. The alveoli are where the gas exchange happens at the lungs. They are these tiny air sacs, about one cell thick, located at the end of the bronchial tubes. And we have lots of them about 400 million in each lung on average. Although there is a wide range, in adults the range has been calculated to be between 270 to 790 million alveoli per lung. What this huge number of alveoli does is provide the lungs with a huge surface area for gas exchange. The more alveoli, the more gas exchange that can happen at the lungs. This exchange of gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide gas, can happen because the alveoli are surrounded by blood capillaries. So the alveoli are the functional units of the lungs that provide a high surface area for gas exchange. The lungs themselves are divided into sections or lobes. Although we have two lungs, they are not exact mirror images of each other. The right lung has three lobes and is slightly larger than the left lung, which has two lobes. And the lungs are enclosed in the thoracic cavity and are protected by the ribcage. The thoracic cavity, which is also called the chest cavity, is the second largest hollow space in the body, the largest being the abdominal cavity, where we find most of the organs of the digestive system. The diaphragm divides the abdominal cavity from the thoracic cavity. The diaphragm is a large sheet of muscle located beneath the lungs, and it is the primary muscle involved in breathing. Although the diaphragm is a large sheet of muscle, and it's not a flat sheet, or at least it is not flat when it's relaxed. When relaxed, the diaphragm is dome-shaped, a bit like an inverted bowl. However, when the diaphragm contracts, it flattens, which then enlarges the chest cavity. So the diaphragm actually works with the ribcage muscles, called the intercostal muscles, when we inhale and exhale. When we breathe in, the diaphragm contracts, moves down, and flattens, which expands the thoracic cavity. The intercostals or rib muscles also contract, which expands the rib cage and upper thoracic cavity. Basically, the contraction of these muscles increases the length and diameter of the chest cavity and thus expands the lungs.
So let's talk about the mechanics of breathing then. And the major thing that drives breathing or pulmonary ventilation is air pressure, namely changing air pressure within the lungs. There is a rule when it comes to air movement and pressure, which is simply this. Air flows from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure. Let's take the example of a balloon to illustrate this concept. When you inflate a balloon, you are forcing air into the balloon. When compared to the air molecules outside the balloon, that is, the air molecules in the room, the air molecules in the balloon are actually packed into a smaller volume and are closer together than the air molecules outside the balloon. There is therefore a higher pressure inside the balloon than outside the balloon. Now, if you let go of the opening of the balloon, the balloon will deflate since air wants to move from an area of higher air pressure to an area of lower air pressure. There is a model that we have in school that tries to simulate how changing air pressures can affect the movement of air in and out of the lungs. The model uses an airtight container to represent the thoracic cavity. An opening at the mouth of the container allows air to enter through a straw into two balloons that represent the lungs. A piece of rubber underneath represents the diaphragm. The model shows that by moving the pretend diaphragm down, we can increase the volume in the container, which in turn decreases the air pressure in the lung balloons. If the air pressure in the balloon is lower than the air pressure in the room, air will move into the lung balloons. When the pretend diaphragm is flattened, however, the air pressure in the lung balloons increases and air moves back out. So when we inhale, our diaphragm contracts and moves down. Our intercostal muscles also contract and expand our rib cage. This combination of our intercostals and diaphragm muscles contracting expands our chest cavity, which then decreases the air pressure inside the lungs, causing it to be lower than the air pressure outside the body. We will call that the atmospheric pressure. And since air flows from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure, air flows into the lungs. The opposite happens when we exhale. The diaphragm relaxes and moves up. The chest cavity constricts and gets smaller, causing air pressure inside the lungs to increase higher than the atmospheric pressure. And as a result, air moves out of the lungs and into the atmosphere. So our ability to breathe is affected by both the air pressure in our lungs, but also the air pressure in the atmosphere. And I don't know if you know this or not, but atmospheric pressure can change, in particular, when we change altitude. If you've ever traveled to a high altitude environment, for example, the Andes Mountains or the Himalayas, you will definitely have noticed that at higher altitudes, it gets harder to breathe. Some people may even get altitude sickness, and at even higher altitudes, like the top of Mount Everest, they may die. But why is that? To understand why this happens, you need to remember that air is made up of different molecules. It is not pure oxygen. Nitrogen makes up about 78% of the air in the atmosphere, and oxygen 21%. This composition of air remains consistent whether we are at sea level or at a higher altitude. However, with a higher altitude, the partial pressure of oxygen in the air, that is, how many molecules of oxygen are in a given volume of air, changes. At sea level, the partial pressure of oxygen is 159 millimeters of mercury, whereas at 8,848 meters above sea level, or in other words, at the summit of Mount Everest, the partial pressure of oxygen is only 53 millimeters of mercury. So at high altitudes, oxygen molecules are further apart because there is less pressure to push them together. This effectively means that there are fewer oxygen molecules in the same volume of air as we inhale. In scientific studies, this is often referred to as hypoxia. So at higher altitudes than sea level, ventilation is increased, meaning we start breathing heavier and more often because there are fewer oxygen molecules in each breath that we take. And even with increased ventilation, there would still be less oxygen throughout the circulatory system, which means that less oxygen would reach muscle cells which makes people at high altitudes feel tired. And also, within the first few hours of altitude exposure, water loss increases as well, which can result in dehydration, 
So many people who ascend to a moderate or high altitude will then experience the effect of acute altitude sickness. Symptoms of altitude sickness typically begin between 6 to 48 hours after arriving at a higher altitude and include headache, nausea, fatigue, dizziness, and disturbed sleep. But when people are exposed to a high altitude for several days or weeks, their bodies can actually begin to adjust to the low oxygen environment. This is a process called acclimation. The increase in breathing rate remains. However, hemoglobin levels can increase, hemoglobin being the protein in our blood that carries oxygen. Also, the ratio of blood vessels to muscle mass can increase. This means that more oxygen will be able to reach body cells after a period of time at higher altitudes. Acclimation to higher altitudes is the reason why people who attempt to climb Mount Everest will spend three to four weeks at a base camp, which is at a much higher altitude than sea level, in order to allow their bodies to acclimate before they make the dangerous climb to the summit. Acclimation to higher altitudes is also the reason why some athletes will train at higher altitudes in order to get their bodies to acclimate to these higher altitudes, produce more hemoglobin, and increase the ratio of blood vessels to muscle mass. When they return to sea level, their ability to compete has increased. So our breathing rate increases in response to the lower atmospheric pressure at higher altitudes. But we don't have to ascend to a high altitude to experience this increase in breathing rate. All we really have to do is some exercise. When you exercise, your body will naturally increase its ventilation rate in response to a higher oxygen need. But how does our body know to do that? How does our body control how fast we breathe? Surprisingly, our breathing rate is not controlled by the amount of oxygen in our blood. Instead, it is controlled by our blood's pH, which changes depending on the amount of carbon dioxide gas dissolved in our blood. Turns out, that when carbon dioxide gas is dissolved in water, like in our bloodstream, some of the molecules of carbon dioxide will react with the water molecules to produce a weak acid called carbonic acid. The more carbon dioxide we have in our blood, the more carbonic acid is produced, the lower our blood pH. pH sensors that are found throughout the body can then detect these changes in blood pH. If blood pH is lower, and a nervous signal is sent to a part of the brainstem called the medulla, which then sends a nervous signal that triggers a higher rate of contraction to the breathing muscles, the diaphragm, and the intercostals. This way, increasing our breathing rate. Okay, so now let's switch topics a bit and talk about lung volumes. That is, how much air our lungs can hold, which by the way, can vary tremendously between individuals. The volume of air that the lungs can hold, or the volume of air a person can inhale and exhale, depends on a variety of factors. So let's take a look at this individual, for example. His name is Michael Phelps, and he is a gold medal winning Olympic swimmer, who also happens to have the largest recorded lung capacity at 12 liters, twice the average. In comparison to Michael Phelps, we have this lady right here. 80-year-old Grandma Jean. Grandma Jean's lung capacity is only 2 liters of air. So why the difference? Can you think of what makes Michael Phelps different than Grandma Jean that might account for their different lung capacities? Pause this video and write some of your ideas down in your notes. So what did you come up with? Okay, but now let's discuss how we can measure the different respiratory volumes and capacities. There are different words that we use when we're talking about respiratory volumes. And so let's start with the residual volume. The residual volume is the amount of air that always remains in our lungs. Even after we forcibly exhale as much air out of our lungs as possible, we can never truly empty our lungs, at least not under normal circumstances. The residual volume is about 1.2 liters on average in males and about 1.1 liter on average in females. So the graph that you see here provides a visual representation of our lung volumes. But I also want to use this empty rectangle right here to represent our lung. And this amount of blue right here will represent the amount of air that is always present in our lungs, the residual volume. Another lung volume that we should be aware of is what we call our tidal volume. Our tidal volume 
is the amount of air that we inhale and exhale during a normal breath. On average, about 500 milliliters or 0.5 liters in both males and females. Now the expiratory reserve volume is the air that we can forcibly exhale out of our lungs after a normal exhalation. So if you try to breathe out as much air as possible, which is about 1.1 liters in males on average and about 0.7 liters in females on average. In contrast, the inspiratory reserve volume is the air that can be forcibly inhaled after a normal inhalation which is about 3.3 liters in males on average and about 1.9 liters in females on average. So these four volumes that I just gave you, the residual volume, the tidal volume, the inspiratory reserve volume, and the expiratory reserve volume are four lung volumes. These four lung volumes combined in different ways can make up the different lung capacity. We're gonna just talk about two of these, the vital capacity, which is the maximum amount of air that can be both inhaled and exhaled, which is about 4.8 liters in males and 3.1 liters on average in females. To measure your vital capacity, you would have to breathe in as much air as you can as possible, fill your lungs as much as you can, and then exhale, breathe out as much air as you can. That amount of air that you will breathe out after you took the deepest inhale would be your vital capacity. The vital capacity then is the sum of the inspiratory reserve volume, the tidal volume, and the expiratory reserve volume. What is not included in the vital capacity is the residual volume. The residual volume, however, is included when we measure our total lung capacity. Our total lung capacity is basically the maximum amount of air that can be held in the lungs. It is about 6 liters in males and about 4.2 liters in females. And the total lung capacity is calculated by adding all the lung volumes or simply adding the vital capacity plus the residual volume. And that's it for our respiratory system. Talk to you soon.